may be seated. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Um, for those who may not know me, my name is Aldrin. I'm one of the elders here at the Virginia Beach SDA Church. We thank you for choosing to worship with us this morning. The message I kind of titled it was Be Ready. Um, and it's funny because I don't know about you guys, but if you have smart devices, it saves almost everything you put into it. And I, I typed the word ready to pull up what I emailed to myself. I actually shared a message similar to this a year ago here at this church. So it's not the same message, don't worry. It's something different. But um, yeah, I, some, of, some of you may not remember it. But this morning before I get into the message, we have so many activities here at the church. I know during announcements, we didn't really give it due uh, justice, but I thought today was International Sabbath, so I wore my <laughs> culture garb, but it's next Sabbath, so as a reminder, it's actually a plug for next Sabbath. So if you have a tire from your country, please wear it, come to Sabbath, and um, share in the different um, cultures that we have. You know, this church is amazing. I think we counted over 16 plus countries represented in the congregation. We may miss some because we don't know everyone where everyone's from. So we should have like a, a united flag or something. I don't know. So make sure we cover everybody. But one of the ones I'd like to emphasize before we get in is the nominating committee. As you saw, next week is their first meeting. I don't know about you guys who've been through nominating committee, but usually when you're approached, we know what some, most of us usually answer. It starts with an N and ends in an O. But I ask that, kind of tying into this message, that pray over it, give it a chance. Um, the, the nominating committee doesn't just nominate you because you're a body or you're a member here. Well, kind of those two have to be a part of it, but you're nominated because they probably see something in you that you yourself may not see or they think that that could be cultivated in you. So pray over it. I know when I started, my answer was usually no, but here I am now in front, so. So first question I have for you this morning is, what are you eagerly waiting for? How many of us have a, vac just a show of hands, a vacation plan coming up soon? Anyone? A few hands. A birthday coming up soon. Anyone? Everyone's hand should go up because every year we have a birthday. Uh, an anniversary. Hopefully every year we have an anniversary. A holiday. Certain holidays are coming up that we look forward to. What do we do for these special occasions? Celebrate. We celebrate them. Sometimes there's a birthday cake or a cake or something done to, to um, to commemorate it, if you will, um, a special dinner, a nice outfit, or we, we prepare for it, right? So the story that, well, I'm sorry, the scripture that um, Gilly shared earlier was Matthew 24, 1 through 14. And it talks about the destruction of the temple and the signs of times. So that passage was stories about false prophets, Jesus said to watch out for those claiming to be Christ. They'll deceive many. There's been in history, as we know, someone like Charles Manson has led so many to such a destruction and death. Someone like Jim Jones, who, ha who coordinated a mass murder in 1978 in Guyana. There are many who claim to be the way to heaven. The disciples were warned over 2,000 years ago, and we are warned today. In 18, there's a story in 1849, a train, a wagon train was traveling through Death Valley to follow the gold rush in California. As this particular wagon train trudged through Death Valley, the hottest place in California, they looked ahead and they saw a sheet of water they all believed was Owens Lake. But this was just a mirage created by the intense heat and the harder they pressed on towards it, the more frustrated they became because it wasn't there. The foundation for many people's spiritual journey is no more real than a mirage. Some people base their entire spiritual lives 
on illusions, whether it's a psychic friend network or astrology or some strange teacher like David Koresh or some new claims to have special insight into the future. Jesus said we would hear about wars, rumors about wars, that nation will rise up against nation and kingdom will rise up against kingdom. Is that not happening today? I would say so. There's a war all around us. Now, not just in the Middle East, Israel, Ukraine, like physical wars with military. Is there not a war on drugs? Could there, one argue that there is a war in our own government on who will become the next president? I'm not going to go into de detail because I know we all have different views on that. But I mean, with everything being shared, it's almost like a war, I would say. The disciples asked Jesus for a sign of his return, and at the end of the age, at, of his return at the end of age, his first response was, watch out that no one deceives you. He knew there would be many false prophets. The simple fact of the matter is that when we look for signs, we become very susceptible to being deceived. There are many false prophets that have counterfeit signs of spiritual power and spiritual authority. The only surefire method of not being deceived is to focus on Jesus and his words. The word of God has all answers. Do not just look at it in part, as many people do. Take it as a whole. Read the entire chapter and book, if possible, to discern the true meaning of what you're reading. Otherwise, you could be fooled by just parts of the scripture. Now, do not look for special signs of his returning. Do not spend time looking at other people and what they have to say about it. Look at Christ, read his word, and he will show you. So there's a story I found about a watchful guard, a story of spiritual vigilance. Long ago in a kingdom surrounded by a vast mountain and dense forest, there was a great city known for its high walls and strong fortress. The city was a beacon of wealth and peace, but its people had one constant tr threat, their enemies from a distant land who were always plotting to take their city by surprise. To protect the city, the king placed watchmen at every gate, stationing them to guard the walls, especially during the night when danger was most likely to come. So when I read this story, actually, I don't know, some of you may know I was in the military. Um, let me get through the verses. I was going to read it, but... Um, so this is one of the towers that we had in Iraq. Um, so I didn't sit in that tower at night. I was in charge of bringing the servicemen to the tower to sit in it for, I think it was a two hour span, and then we rotate them. There was, I think, over 40 at the camp I was at in Iraq. But um, that kind of reminded me of this when I was reading the story that people do still sit and watch over certain areas in our, our world today. But um, I remember at first I was like, you know, I'll be a good leader and I'll climb. I had four towers I was responsible for. After the third one, I was like, you know what, guys, you can go up on your own. I'm not going to go up with you. Usually we have to check, make sure everything's clean and everything's serviceable. But so if you could imagine, it didn't quite look like this because this is further back in history. But among the watchmen, there was a young soldier named Daniel. Daniel was proud of his role, knowing that the safety of the entire city depended on his vigilance. His job was simple but crucial. Keep watch over the city gate, especially during the darkest hours of the night when everyone else was asleep. One day, the captain of the guards gathered all the soldiers and said, Listen carefully, for I have tro heard troubling news. Our enemy is planning on an attack. We don't know when or where they will strike, but they will come when we least expect it. It could be tonight. It could be next month. Your task is to remain awake, alert, vigilant, and watchful. If you fall asleep, the city, the city will be vulnerable, and many lives could be lost. So Daniel took these words to heart. For many nights, he stood guard at his post, his eyes never leaving the horizon. His heart was filled with determination to protect his people. Each night was long and quiet. The moonlight cast shadows on the walls, and the only sounds were the distant howls 
of the wolves in the forest. But Daniel remained focused, knowing that any moment the enemy could pop up. However, as weeks went by without any sign of danger, Daniel began to grow weary. Perhaps the captain was wrong, he thought to himself. Why should the enemy attack now? The city has been at peace for years. Maybe I can relax. On one particular night, the air was cool and the fog rolled in, covering the city a soft, quiet mist. It was the perfect night for an attack, but Daniel, now comfortable in his role, began to feel the weight of sleep pressing down on him. He leaned against the stone wall of the gate, his eyes heavy, and thought, just for a moment, I'll close my eyes just for a moment, and the enemy will not come tonight. As soon as Daniel closed his eyes, he drifted into sleep. His mind lulled by the quiet of the night, but in the fog, the enemy approached the city. They moved silently, taking advantage of the guards' inattentiveness. They crossed the outer fields, slipped past the walls, and reached the unguarded gate. With no one to sound the alarm, the enemy quietly infiltrated the city. Daniel awoke with a start. His heart raced as he realized he had fallen asleep on duty. He looked out over the gate and saw nothing but the mist. Thank God no one saw me, he thought, relieved. But as soon as he turned to resume his watch, he heard a distant cry. The enemy was already inside the city. The sounds of swords filled the air. The city was under attack. The very thing the captain had warned them had come to pass. Daniel's failure to remain vigilant had allowed the enemy to slip in unnoticed. And now the city was in chaos. The captain of the guards rushed, rushed to Daniel's post. His face filled with disappointment and anger. I warned you, Daniel, he cried. I told you to keep watch, for the enemy would come when you least expected it. Because you let your guard down, the city is now in danger. Daniel had hung his head in shame. He had been trusted with the tr responsibility of watching over the city, but he let his own comfort and complacency lead him astray. The battle raged through the night, and through the, though the city eventually repelled the attackers, many lives were lost, and the city was left in turmoil. This story was of a soldier whose job was to guard the city gates at night. His captain warned him that the enemy could attack at any moment, and the soldier needed to stay ready all the time. At first, the soldier was very careful. He was very diligent. But as the nights went on without any signs of danger, he began to relax. One night he fell asleep, and that was the night that the enemy attacked. This story parallels the message in Matthew 24, 42, where Jesus says, Watch therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. Just like the soldier, we need to stay spiritually alert and not become complacent. Jesus is coming, but we must be prepared at all times, even when things seem quiet. I asked Gina to put this clock up here, and she asked me, do I put the hands on it? I said, you know what, let's not, because we don't know what time Jesus comes. I mean, she asked me, do you want three o'clock, six o'clock, you know, looks good on the clock. I was like, well, first off, this is a Timex she gave me. So she didn't give me nothing fancy. It's, it's just a simple Timex. But um, we don't know. So I wish I could put the time to let us know when Jesus comes, but we really don't know. But we live our lives according to time. It's just how life is. So this morning, I wonder if you ask the question, how do we get prepared or stay prepared? We have foundational beliefs that are simple and clear that we can follow. And this morning, I would like to share a few with you. If you had a bulletin, there was an insert in there with seven um, verses, and I'm gonna review them with you really quickly. I'll give you an example or an analogy on how this connects us with the teachings. So the first one is the Bible is our guide. We believe that the Bible is God's word and it's the ultimate guide for us for how we live our lives. It shows us who God is, how to live well, and what's ahead in the future. Think of the Bible as a GPS. Just like you use Google Maps or to get to a destination, 
the Bible helps guide us on our path to a life with God. Without it, we're lost or wandering without direction. The scripture there is 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God, breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Jesus is our savior. Jesus is the son of God, and he came to earth to save us from our sins. He lived a perfect life, died for our sins, and rose again so that we could have eternal life. Now imagine you have a close friend who took the punishment for something you did wrong out of pure love. That's what Jesus did for us. He paid the price so we could be free and live forever with him. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Spiritual salvation is a gift. We can't earn our way to heaven by being good enough. Salvation is a free gift that we give, that we receive by believing in Jesus and following him. Now imagine you receive a gift Actually, I could do this. Who here's birthday's today? Sister Joan, your birthday's today? Really? Well, I've got a gift for you. Here you go, Sister Joan. Here you go, Sister Joan. So that came from my wallet, not the treasury. I'm also the treasurer here, so. Two separate pockets of money. This is my money, this is the church's. No, I'm just joking. So, Sister Joan probably wasn't expecting that she was going to receive a small gift. It's nothing big, don't worry. My wife would kill me if it was big. So, she received something and she wasn't expecting it. She didn't pay for it, but aren't you excited or you thankful that she received something? In the same way, God gives us salvation for free. We just have to accept it. Just like Sister Jonah said, we have to accept salvation. So the scripture for that is Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. The second coming of Jesus. What does that mean? One of the biggest beliefs we have is that Jesus is coming back soon to take his followers to heaven. This is called the second coming. It's like waiting for an event. You're super excited about it, like a concert or a trip with your friends. We don't know the exact date or how, hour that it might be, but we know it's gonna happen. We need to be ready by staying connected with Jesus. Matthew 24, four, so you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you don't expect. The importance of the three angels' message. Revelations shares three angels deliver messages to the world that talk about worshiping God, warning against false teachings, and preparing for Jesus' return. It's our mission to share these messages with the world. Now, imagine being part of a global movement, spreading word about something life-changing. We shall see these messages with others so that they too can be ready for Jesus. If you don't think we're able to do that now, I'm almost guaranteed everyone here has a phone in your pocket that can reach out anywhere in the world. And you too can be reached from anywhere in the world. So believe that the signs are showing that Jesus is coming soon. And to, to reiterate that is Revelations 14, 6 through 12. I won't read that this morning, but you can read it later. We will live forever with Jesus. So when Jesus returns, he will take us to heaven and we will live forever in a perfect world where there is no pain, suffering, or death. Imagine a place where everything is beautiful. There is no drama or bullying. You're surrounded by love and peace. That's what heaven will be like. John 14, 2 and 3, my father's house has many rooms. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. I will come back and I will and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. And one other belief I'd like to share this morning is judgment and God's justice. 
We know that Jesus will come back, but there will be a time of judgment. But we don't need to fear it. Which is funny because I remember as I was younger growing up, do you remember those who've been in the faith for longer? We emphasize thou shalt not a lot in the church. Um, but it's not something we should fear. If we trust in Jesus, he will stand for us and declare us not guilty because of what he has done for us on the cross. So setting is a court and your lawyer is your best friend who loves you and has already paid your fine. That's what Jesus does for us during judgment. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We have this hope that burns in our heart. Hope in the coming of the Lord. Spiritual readiness is about living with hope. We are not watching out of fear, but out of joyful expectation that Christ is coming soon to make all things right. Do you want to live ready? Living in readiness means looking forward towards forward to Christ's return with anticipation, not dread. Keep your focus on the promises of God and the hope of eternal life. We should keep our faith strong, especially during our trials. Just as the watchful guard looked for the sunrise after a long night, we keep our eyes on the promise of Jesus' return, knowing that his coming will bring an end to a suffering, pain, and sin. So the call to be ready for, Jesus, for Christ's return is a call to live active, faithful, and hopeful in Christ. Just as the guard stays, must stay alert, we must stay spiritually vigilant to protect our relationship with God and help others prepare. And my last question, are you living ready for Jesus' return? If you've, fallen spiritually, if you've fallen asleep spiritually, now is the time to wake up and renew your commitment to Christ. He is coming soon. Let's be ready together, watching and waiting in hope.